Hello audience, it's about 10, 10 a.m. on um, the well, on the morning of June 15th of 2013. It's uh, Saturday morning. I usually timestamp a lot of my stuff just so I can track my development in, in articulation and learning. Uh, <clears throat> but it's important for me to mention the date right now because uh, today is the two-year anniversary of when Thomas James Ball had... Um, self-immolated, had uh, set himself on fire committing suicide that way to protest, well, basically, as uh, I understand it, to protest the gynocentrism in the uh, court system and how it, it just it commits so much injustice against men. Um, you know, we hear every day about, you know, women who don't want their kids and all that, so they throw, they throw a you know, newborn baby in a dumpster or, you know, women stalking themselves on Facebook so they can gain sympathy and all this other kind of stuff. I mean, you just watch, you know, a YouTube channel on, uh, well, on the internet, uh, <clears throat> and the user on, uh, the YouTube user, uh, his, his, uh, name that he chose is Violent Women Among Us. Excellent guy. Uh, he also created Vagina Pass as a, as a backup account, and, um, but anyway, uh, Violent Women Among Us, uh, that YouTube user, um, he, he, just, he just basically watches television and just takes these clips from, from uh, news broadcasts and puts them onto the computer, uploads them to the internet of, you know, these uh, news clips of women doing these same horrible things that women and feminists and society negatively stereotypes men for doing. And so you, so you really take a look at this, and you, I mean, you'll see that, that women are capable of all kind of horrible things. And yet, you know, um, many years ago, uh, you know, there was a time when Thomas James Ball lost his cool when dealing with his daughter and, like, slapped her one time or something like that. And, uh, and then the mom, the, the mother found out about it and then talked to the neighbor about it. And the, and the neighbor's like, you got to fry that asshole. He's, he's, you know, he's, he's dangerous for the kids. Man, you, you need to take him to court and man, make the jerk pay. Man. Um, I just got to respond to Giggoy. Um, uh, <laughs> uh. Um, <laughs> um. So anyway, a gig away, um, and some other people are chatting me on Facebook. So anyway, you know, the wife just totally just just dominated over um, <clears throat> over uh, Thomas James Ball in court, and um, was making him, you know, was trying to make him pay all kind of money and stuff. Uh, and Thomas James Ball had lost his job. Uh, he was unemployed. Um, he, I don't know if he got laid off or whatever. But um, he he lost his ability to pay child support and expenses like that. So, um, well, the, the wife didn't care. She wanted money out of him, so she took him to court and... and um, was I think he was going to face possible prison time or something like that for for uh child support owed and and um and he was unable to pay it because he didn't have a job and well his his selfish uh gynocentrically bigoted wife didn't care um so what did she do well you know just wanted him, wanted him to go to prison and all that and uh he decided you know this is unfair uh look at how the system treats men uh so um so he uh he he as as a form of protest he uh went to the Keene County I think it is um let me look it up right here um 
Uh, well, it's the, uh, no, not Keene County, but uh, Cheshire County Superior Courthouse. Um, and uh, poured gasoline on himself and set himself on fire. Um, just before 5.30 p.m. on the evening of June 15th of 2011. And... Um, yeah, and the only news agency that would that, that would even cover this story was a local news agency in the area, and um, they got there, I guess, just right after it happened, and um, and interviewed people, and I, I've got that video, um, it's on YouTube, and uh, I've got it archived, um, and so anyway, um, well... Uh, the, the local, or I mean, well, the local news is the only ones who would cover it. The the national news, you know, such as CNN, Fox, MSNBC, and uh, others, would not even make a mention of the existence of this incident. Um, no, because they were busy talking about two gay guys who got kicked out of a, a public pool for you know, public display of affection or, like, whatever. And, like, now some people would regard that as, you know, something that's, that's um, you know, a, a crime against civil rights or whatever. And, well, I don't know if it is or not. I'm not going to touch on that issue. But the point is, the, 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 uh, the, the national news had smaller issues they rather focus on. Or maybe they didn't even become aware of it. But then again... Come on, I mean, look at the, I don't know, but anyway, they didn't, the, the national news did not cover it, and the story just died out. Well, us in the men's movement, we, uh, we revive it. <clears throat> so anyway, now, I got up this morning, and, and I was watching, uh, Shake, um, uh, his, his video, um, on YouTube, his channel is, uh, Dude, uh, Dude Desi 07. Um, and he put out this video. When is it? When's the upload date? Um, okay, June 15th. Okay, so he uploaded it recently. Um, like within a. Yeah. Anyway, and, you know, it's about the myth of angelic Eastern woman. And it's a good title. Um, and it's a pretty good video. And this time he wasn't screencasting with, you know, using uh, Windows Vista. I'm glad one of these days, hopefully, he gets off of Windows because it sucks. Windows is gets Microsoft Windows gets on my nerves so much. It's it's not even worth pirating, you know. <clears throat> anyway, so here's what I said to uh, to Shake. You know, uh, well, on I posted on this video. I said. Uh, you know, Shake Dude Desi 07 is correct that female nature and uh, that, that that female uh, that, that feminism needs female uh, nature in order to function. I mean, it does. It's just like a computer with you know, if you need a computer to do something, you need hardware capability and then the software to make it do it. Okay, uh, this stuff is universal human nature. Things such as jealousy, selfishness, anger, fear, etc. However, these things are more often manifest in in women. Uh, during our modern time because there has been a culture invented to nurture it. It came uh, into being when people such as the proto-feminists, as I'm going to start calling them, such as Susan B. Anthony and the White Feather campaigns of World War I began to basic, uh, began to basically begin trying to overthrow men. I, I put, you know, redundancy. Word, uh, word redundancy. Okay, yeah, see, that's the thing. You gotta understand what real, uh, what what oppression really means to women. Like, they've never been institutionally oppressed, such as blacks um, or 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 Jews or anything like that. Um, but women feel like they've been oppressed. Now there is something that oppresses them, and it's not governments or men or anything that they really actually try to make you believe. Now, they do have some Freudian slips from time to time. Um, and, uh, yeah, and they do sometimes tell the truth. What it is, they, first of all, they are oppressed by their own choices, their own selfishness, 
their own greed, manipulation, destructive actions, their own ignorance, their foolishness, their arrogance. They are cons- they, they are the all-consuming self. They are weighted down by their their negative attributes, uh, negative psychological attributes. Um, and this is a human nature thing also. Uh, that you know it, it applies to both men and women. This is human nature that I'm talking about, but it seems more manifest in women because these types of things are nurtured. They either uh, occur with impunity, or sometimes they're nurtured if things can be switched around. If the female is cunning enough to to um, to basically manipulate others into believing what she wants them to believe and then going along <clears throat> with what she says and does to basically um, basically um, generate a environment of impunity for the female's actions. You see this all the time. Jody Arias did it. You know, uh, here it is. She brutally murdered her, her ex-boyfriend, uh, Travis Alexander, you know, shot him in the face, stabbed him 29 times, including nine times in the back. There were multiple defensive stab wounds in his forearms and his hands and all that. Uh, she attacked him in the shower uh, and took a picture of him right before she killed him. Um, it's almost like a trophy. Um, or, you know, it's like, Honey, I want to remember this moment forever. Just like just like that movie, uh, The Addams Family Values, which released in 1993, um, where um, uh, th- this character, I forgot her last name, but her first name is Debbie, and it's played by Joan Cusack. Um, she um, marries men for money and then kills them afterward. Well, you know... Notice what she does, you know, she, um, she, um, you know, takes a picture, she says, Hey there, Snooky Wookums, I just want to remember you in this precious moment. Takes a picture of him or whatever, and then tries to kill him. Well, Fester is who she tries to kill, and that, you know, Uncle Fester, and he can't seem to die, um, because he's an Adams. And so she tries multiple methods. She actually gets all mad when he doesn't die, you know. I think one of the first method she tries to do is um, he's taking a bath and she plugs in a toaster and throws it in the bathtub um, and uh, and then he gets electrocuted but he doesn't die um, and then uh, a light bulb pops out of the uh, light fixture and lands in the bathtub next thing you know when all the electricity stops you know when the circuit breaker is shorted out Um, you know, you see this glow of light all of a sudden, and Fester basically has a a light bulb in his mouth, and it's implying that he functions like a capacitor and had absorbed the electricity and and is now dissipating it into a light bulb, and he's smiling about it because he doesn't know, you know, that, that, you know, his wife is trying to kill him. Uh, what's another method? Uh, oh yeah, the, the, one of the more elaborate is where she, um, wraps up a gift present for him, just like in uh, the the uh, 1953 uh, Disney's Peter Pan animated movie, um, which, yeah, released 40 years before the the um, the uh, the uh, Adams Family Values. Well, anyway, and um, you know she you know Debbie says she's going out shopping, and then. Um, you know, and then uh, she's out hanging around at the bar with a bunch of guys, you know, even though she's married, uh, getting all this attention from them. She notices, uh, you know, the clock uh, or, well, you know, her watch or whatever, notices the time, and then dresses almost like, you know, a weeping widow or whatever, just something. It's been a while since I've seen the movie. So anyway, she pulls up right in front of her house and looks at the clock, and then all of a sudden the house explodes and um, throwing parts of the house everywhere, and there's like a flaming toilet seat that falls on the hood of her car because she's parked that close to the house. And then, uh, and then um, Fester comes out with like I don't know a meatloaf or something that he like was cooking in the oven or whatever. And he's like, "Debbie, am I, am I late for dinner?" Or like whatever he said. And uh, and she's all pissed off because he didn't die from that. 
Uh, it was a strong enough blast to destroy the house and throw pieces of, of, of you know, the house everywhere, and yet Fester being inside the house, matter of fact, in the same room as the bomb, and, you know, and it, it didn't injure him. I think he just had, like, you know, like char marks on him or whatever from, you know, uh, burn residue uh, from whatever that was burning around him. You know, like you typically see whenever you come in contact with some with an object that has been burned. It's basically carbon, you know, uh, soot and carbon residue. Anyway, um, so so uh, Jody Arias uh, brutally murdered uh, Travis Alexander, was taking a snapshot in time of him before she killed him. Um, yeah, like I said, she shot him in the face with a pistol, um, stabbed him 29 times, including nine times in the back, several defensive wounds to the fore, uh, forearm and, and uh, hands, and, uh, and then, um, uh, attempted to decapitate him. Uh, she cut him, uh, she cut his throat from side to side and from ear to ear, as they say, and but she cut it so deep. It's not like she was just trying to cut the the jugular, you know, uh, veins or arteries or any type of, you know, uh, uh, circulatory system. It wasn't like that. She cut deep um, through the muscle, and the 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 uh, forensics uh, uh, and uh, and the coroners and all that. They said that. Um, they said that the only thing that stopped the blade of the knife from going all the way through his neck is his uh, his spine and um you know the the vertebrae bone and all that so uh yeah she uh, Jody Arias tried to decapitate him and all that and then she physically murdered him uh murdered his body but then she tried to murder um i guess i don't know his essence or whatever she tried to murder his public perception by then, you know, claiming that he abused her and sexually assaulted her and all that. But see, her stories keep changing. And she had her female inmates convinced and all that because, you know, they're women and they are vulnerable and blind and, and, um, and malleable to believe in this whole thing of, Yeah, this asshole guy, he did sexual things to me that he shouldn't have done. Man, because we know how men are. They're just excessively sexual. And it's just arrogance and, and you know, shallow understanding and just stupid. You know, and a lot of it's projection. Um, you know, when, when women and men are surveyed, you know, women are more, you know, they report themselves as, you know, according in the survey, they, they report themselves as being, you know, more likely to do things, um, that cross the line of decency in regards to sexuality, um, towards men. Of course, men, you know, they, regardless of whatever their fantasies are, they, you know, they do have a fear of doing certain things with a woman. Mm. And um, myself and the Disposable Human Doing and several other guys can tell you um, about the sexual nature of females. I, I tell you, when a female really gets in the mood for sex, um, <clears throat> she will tell the man to do stuff to her that men are typically told in society that, that is the wrong thing to do. Uh, I remember my former owner, uh, she had this, um, this one fetish about being slammed up against a wall. Um, and, you know, it was just, it, it was weird because it's like, you know, she's telling you to do that to her because it, you know, it stimulates the moment. And, man, and it's like, you know, like, you know, they, she says it makes it more exciting and, man. Well, then, you know, you're wondering, you know, when, when you know, you, you're wondering, like, what would happen if you threw this 200-pound person up against a wall? It's like, why should I be doing this? You know, it's like, is this even necessary? Uh, you know, because you're in an apartment that you're renting, and you don't want to actually damage the wall, and all that, so, you know, uh, you put on a, a, a low list of priorities, you know, and she's like, oh, why won't you do it, man? Oh, like, all kind of, you don't even know. You don't even know. One time, she was really in the mood and, and wanted to be really spontaneous. She wanted, 
having sex in the friggin' bedroom in the bed apparently wasn't good enough for her. She, you know, wanted to go outside freaking naked, and it was cold outside. Wanted to go outside naked, lean up, you know, uh, up against the freaking back of the apartment, and, you know, wanted sex that way. And it's like, no. No, first of all, it's cold. Second of all, you know, I don't feel like getting out of bed because it was going on right there in the bedroom. It's like, it's not necessary to go out of the bedroom. And, and second, you know, sometimes the police drive through and they do shine their spotlight in back of the building to check up on things and all that because it's just, you know, they're right next to the road. And no, I don't need to be caught by the cops just to satisfy, you know, some girl's freaking fantasy. But these are the things that they do. Um, yeah, how about, you know, being bit? Yeah, she had that one too. That fantasy and fetish and all that. There's a lot of stuff. And you got to understand the human mind in order to understand these things. But no, no, no. People in society, you know, the so-called normal people, they just want to, you know, they just want to believe that girls are all full of wholesomeness and they're wonderful. And, and you know, and you should just, you know, treat them really nice and put them up on a pedestal. And, um, you know, because, you know, they, they're they the mothers. They give life to the tribe. And, and it's a you know it's a hard no it's a hard knock life being a woman it's just dumb no it's time that women need to evolve just like men have uh women have actually held themselves back uh they chose not to evolve they chose to they they've basically women have forced developmental evolution upon the male gender by having the male do all kinds of things for her so that she could focus on doing her, her primary role of, you know, being the uterus that gives life to the tribe, you know? And, um, so anyway, this has been going on for thousands of years, and this is why men are stronger. See, you always hear, well, men are stronger than women, so, you know, women need special provisions and protections, and man, I'm like thinking, why are men stronger than women? You ever thought about that? Yeah, yeah, men generally are stronger than women, but why? Because men have been expected to do the dangerous and physically extraneous work and all kinds of things through society in order to accommodate and satisfy the female. Um, let's see. And what else? Mm. And... Um, Anyway, what this really gets down to, okay, if you understand the OSI um, a model for uh, computer transactions, network transactions, you know, network transfers, um, and that sort of thing, uh, you know, you got the, the lowest level, which is level one, which is the, the actual, well, it's within, the, like, the physical layer. You got actual bits, you know, pulses of electricity. Then you have, you know... Uh, groups of these pulses of electricity like sequences and all that and they mean something and then you know and then you have you know you structure it more and more and then it becomes protocols then it becomes um um all sorts of other things you know application requests uh for for uh file transfers and all that until it gets to the point in which you know you click on an option in a menu on a program and then it transfers something to you know another device and um, so there's so much abstraction there well what I do is when I try to teach men about these kinds of things I use the OSI model uh, you can look it up on Wikipedia uh, I use the OSI model as a example of understanding human nature um, and, and how humans behave and all that. You know, at the very high level, it, you know, it's all about what, what people say that they want. And then you, you understand each level beneath that, and then it gets to, you know, the whole biological, um, um, you know, kind of, uh, well, it gets basically down to existentialism. Uh, existentialism, that's what this all originates from. Uh, the human nature, everything. Uh, it's it it is existentialism, and there is a um, there is a level of existentialism that goes down to the very smallest components of the human body, which are the individual cells. 
uh, they they are constantly trying to survive. You know, they they do have a lifespan. They do die off, but they replicate as part of perpetuating their existence. And this goes on and on. And then you know, this this causes the creation of tissues, the maintenance of tissues, bone material, uh, hair. Um, you know. Um, and the functions of the body, and then then it becomes you know organs, and then organs become systems, uh, and syst- and everything is built upon the the application of of uh, existentialism. Uh, it perpetuates existence, and then um, and then to the point in which you know you got the medulla oblongata which which you know regulates your breathing uh which uh regulates um your heartbeat uh, all these functions uh well you got the spinal cord also but you know you got the lower parts uh of the uh of the uh of the central nervous system and how it's all about uh, coordinating uh, the functions of your organs and and uh, systems in your body to perpetuate your own existence. And what this functions as, see, yeah, your cells replicate and they perpetuate, you know, they 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 uh, they uh, perpetuate the existence of themselves and the tissues and all that. And it's all built upon layers, but it all begins with your cells. Um, uh, multiplying, reproducing for the purpose of of um, of perpetuating existence, and then it goes on up, to, like I had mentioned, and then you know the purpose of the lower functions of your brain is to keep you alive and all that. Then you know, and then of course it affects. Uh, it also has an effect on your um, on the higher functions of your brain, uh, your uh, cerebra- cerebellum, or, or is it cerebrum? I, I'll have to look it up again. But anyway, it's the largest part of your brain, and it's the one where you actually have conscious thought. And and then, you know, you, the other parts of, of your brain and nervous system affect that and cause you to do things that perpetuate your own existence, such as eating food, drinking water, um, uh, you know, the right temperature and this and that, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that sort of thing. Well, this this kind of reminds me of the OSI model, sort of, in a way. But see, just as, you know, you got with a physical body, there's this perpetualism, uh, you know, about existentialism. Uh, there, There's also something like that in the in the human psyche, in the human mind, and that sort of thing that, that that's similar that follows similar structure and purpose, um, and people need to become aware of that now because of the functions of this kinds of, of this thing that I'm talking about. It it causes you know selfishness, and it's it's I think it's easier to understand than it is to articulate because nobody really talks about this much. And it's responsible for human nature, innate human nature. Now, keep in mind, the female of the species has one thing in particular that the male does not have, which is a uterus. Yes, uh, a woman, you know, biologically cannot have, uh, uh, you know, a baby without, um, you know, naturally cannot have, uh, cannot get pregnant without the genetic contribution of the male. However, science is changing that. And of course, feminists and female supremacists and all that, they, you know, they get all excited about this, saying, look, women are earning their independence from men. And it's like, wow, so just leave men behind, huh? It reminds me, there's a there's a insane jealousy um, that the female has over the male because she perceives him to be complete in the ways that she is not. And... But I to to this I say that it is f- the female's fault because the female put the male on this type of um, uh, path of developmental evolution uh, to where he, you know it's through a type of evolution he he developed himself further such as you know through time and history being exposed to more physically extreme uh, physically strenuous environments caused his body to adapt. 
And well, this is on the macrocosm um, scale. But then there's the uh, there's the microcosm, which is that an individual person. Let's say um, you know somebody sits around on the couch and watches TV all the time. Well, they can lift weights and do you know types of work and all that, and build their muscles and become stronger than they already were. This is an example of the microcosm. Now, on the mi on the macrocosm um, level. Uh, the, the male gender has been doing this for thousands of years. Maybe tens of thousands, whatever. But, you know, maybe even millions. I'm not sure. But it's been going on for a long time. Now, women understand that men have these capabilities, you know, physical capabilities. They have the intelligence because they were expected to design and, and plan cities and buildings and, and, um, and systems of infrastructure and... Um, and all this kind of stuff. They they see the, uh, men's accomplishments, and you know, and up until the twentieth century, you know, women and men were somewhat equal, sort of, in that you know they both had to work toward you know they both had to provide a role toward the perpetual existence of the species. And I think this is what women are really talking about when they say oppression. Okay, this, this is what they mean, but that's not what they say. Because, you know, if they were to say, we've been having children for a long time and we've been burdened with children, then, then society can say, well, darling, you're just going to have to deal with it because, you know, you know, because, well, that's just what, you know, your role is as a woman to bear children so that the species can exist, you know. And, and women are afraid that they'll be told that, I'm, I'm sure. So, you know, what women do is they, they, they look through the lens of feeling, you know, how things affect them, you know, it, it, you know, how things make them feel. And then the woman, you know, feels like she's been shortchanged or, or cheated or whatever of what she wanted you know, which is to be, uh, have a feeling of completeness. Uh, she wants her reproductive nature, so she can have that monopoly um, uh, in society and, um, and have market value for that. But she also wants what the man has, which is, uh, you know, um, um, superior strength, intellect, status in society, and these things that men have achieved. And yes, men have achieved them, and they had to work toward them and all that. Well, women don't understand what it's like to work toward those kinds of things because for a long time, things were just given to them. They took it for granted. You know, the men took care of the women, and so the women took that for granted, just like how children do. And um, so anyway, they... Um, so the so the women are very jealous and see they feel very incomplete and very inadequate and very insignificant. There there's some things about them they they feel very empty inside and I think that's what drives them so much to consume, um, to be the all consuming self. Mm. They almost remind me of like a black hole that sucks everything in. Okay, and so. We've arrived at the at the 20th century, and or toward it, because this stuff began in the late 19th century, you know, the late 1800s. Um, right around the time when men got the right to vote, you know, a couple decades after the Civil War, and all that, because of that whole political franchise issue with, you know, uh, with uh, military service. And then men got the right to vote uh, because of that. And then women were jealous, you know, uh, women such as Susan B. Anthony, they're like, well, these men have the right to vote, and that's wrong, we, should have the, we women should have the right to vote too. So she went out and vote, voted and broke the law and wanted to be punished for it and all that, um, you know, to, to try to say, you know, it's either punish me or change the law. Meh! And, um... And, you know, Susan B. Anthony, I know she's, she's regarded as a hero for women, but no, she's, she's an offender because what she did is, you know, she didn't earn the right to vote, you know, or whatever, or pledge uh, her life uh, like men do with the draft to, you know, uh, in order to have a uh, political franchise. You know, she wanted political franchise without the equivalent sacrifice that men were expected to um to, you know, to do in order to have voting rights. She just wanted to take it for herself. And then, of course, there's the White Feather campaigns of World War One, 
and you can I've talked about those before. Uh, you know, women uh, were jealous of what they perceived to be men's privilege in society. And all that. keep in mind, this is all when the standard of living had had increased to the point in which you no longer, you know, that people don't really have to worry about their needs, their basic human needs, as much as they had in previous generations, previous decades, previous centuries. Now, you know, the 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 world of uh, of of desire, you know, of having what you desire, having the you know, status in society or having the the gadgets or the luxury or whatever was coming into view. It was becoming more attainable. And um, all that. Women seen this coming up and they wanted it. But they wanted it for themselves and they perceived men to have an unfair advantage. Uh, so they began their girl power movement, and, and these people, you know, uh, back in the early 20th century, the late 19th century, these people are what I call the proto-feminist, because they were, they were resembling feminism by attribute and by, uh, desire and scope, but they weren't calling themselves feminists yet, and it had not quite developed into what we know feminism today. Now, what we know as feminism today certainly developed in the 1960s. It emerged and gave itself a name and all that uh, because society, we, you know, because at that point in the 1960s, it was toward the peak of American civilization in the 1950s and 1960s, you know, uh, mass production had made the nation very prosperous. It was the good times in America, you know? And women were insanely jealous. Uh, you know, they, 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 see, it's this reoccurring theme of, of emptiness, um, you know, lack of significance, lack of accomplishment, you know, that the female feels and all that. And, um, so, so she just takes more and more, like she's trying to fill an empty void that can never be filled, and so right around, and see here's another punch in the face, another, you know, another um, violation of, of, you know, of a, a, basically another um, offense against the human species. Because when the African Americans, the blacks, uh, in the 1960s were struggling to obtain civil rights and end the, and put an end to the actual institutionalized oppression that they had been suffering for generations and so forth... Um, when they were, you know, struggling to put an end to that, finally, and achieve, and achieve legal equality with, you know, basically whites and, and uh, other people, and just, just have a place, uh, you know, to just be treated as equal in society and basically stop being treated like crap. Uh, you know, people like Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King, and then there was others. Uh, when they were struggling uh, to basically do something that benefited, you know, the human condition, as I'm going to put it that way. And, you know, and then here came women trying to piggyback on it, hijack the whole, you know, concept, and then say that women were oppressed and try to make it seem like women were oppressed at least as much as blacks or more and all that. And they just took it by force, you know. The 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 this, the you know the uh, the African American civil rights movement was treated horribly a lot of times. I mean, Martin Luther King was shot in the neck with a high powered rifle back in 1968. Uh, Malcolm X was shot a bunch of times in 1965. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen the old films of. Um, you know, black civil rights leaders just marching through the streets and being, you know, um, basically shot with a fire hose and knocked down and beaten by police batons and all that. And yet women did not, you know, women did not endure that. You know, when women went out and protested in the streets, the police backed off and just let them do it, you know. Whereas with, you know, the... the uh, Male civil rights leaders, well, basically these guys, the civil rights leaders, so many of them were men. I think all of them were men, at least the ones that you see in film and all that. And, um, historical films. And yeah, and you see these these civil rights leaders, they're black and they're men, and they get beat up by the police. They get beat, they get, like, their, their face busted open, you know, they, all this stuff. Well, look at what happened to William Brown in 1919. 
that guy was brutally murdered. He was lynched, shot, and burned um, by an angry mob, and he was a black guy of about 40 years old, and all this happened to him. He, he, was, he was hung, shot, burned, and all that because a white woman accused him of raping her. I mean, yeah, there was the prejudice, the racism, all this stuff, you know, the, 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 the hatred and all that, yeah. But apparently not even that was enough to get the guy killed because this had been going on for years and decades and all that. And, you know, in William Brown's life, you know, this had been going on for months or years or whatever. And, and you know, he was still alive, you know. I'm, I'm sure people hated him or, or, you know, was distrustful of him. But, you know, the point is the guy was still alive up until a white woman accused him of, of raping her. And then everybody's like, this evil savage, we gotta kill him. Man. And then they killed him pretty horribly and all that. And the uh, famous actor by the name of Henry Fonda was about 14 years old and witnesses from across the street, because, uh, you know, he was uh, at his dad's workplace um, spending time there with his dad. And his, and his dad's like, hey, boy, watch this, man. And like had Henry Fonda look outside the uh, the window and 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 witness the brutal lynching and it, it left it, it affected uh Henry Fonda and uh for the rest of his life and he dedicated his life to to um to being to be against prejudice and stuff like that you can actually notice this in the movie of um it's called 12 Angry Men which came out in 1957 you know, decades after the William Brown incident, uh, the lynching and all that. And there's a part of the movie which kind of really sticks out. It's very outstanding because I'm not sure if it was part of the original uh, teleplay or script or whatever. Because it just pops out at you, whereas other things in the movie blend in more. And it's, um, you know, uh, and it's where Henry Fonda gives gives this little speech that lasts about a minute or whatever. says, you know... You know, there's so many prejudices today. And it almost seems like a public service announcement just popping up at you. And, I, you know, it's it's right after uh, Lee J. Cobb's character gets, like, really mad and says that he... Um, no, no, wait. No, okay, I remember. It's when uh, Ed Begley's character just rants on... I think it's when he rants on and on about, you know, these kids these days and, and not a one of them are any good and that sort of thing. Yeah, because everybody, they, they get sick of hearing it. And then they all walk away from the guy and all that and, like, spread out across the room and just try to ignore the guy. And um, and then, you know, Ed Begley's character, he's like juror number 10. And, you know, and he just basically calms down and shuts up because he sees everybody's reaction. And so then Henry Fonda sits back down and he says... You know, it's not easy overcome. You know, overcoming the feelings of prejudice. Remember, he's like, just give him a little speech like that. That might not. That might not have been the same exact words, but he does mention prejudice. It's like, you know, prejudice grips society and all that. And then he's basically functioning. You know, Henry Fonda's character, you know, juror number eight, is functioning as um, the the uh, voice of reason. And then when the other jurors uh, in the room they hear his voice, they hear him talking about this. They all, one by one, slowly start to come back and sit down around him and all that. And, uh, yeah, and it's an excellent movie. Uh, I've got it on DVD. Uh, I got the collector's edition. I'll, I'll probably buy it on Blu-ray also. I've seen it several times. It's the 1957 version of uh, 12 Angry Men. It's a classic. It's well worth the money. Henry Fonda is amazing in there. And they, they had good actors in there. They had a bunch of good casting. Um... And it was just really well written, and it was good. But anyway, but yeah, so the, the civil rights leaders who were predominantly male uh, tried to benefit the human condition in prejudice and, you know, uh, horrible treatment and just all kind of stuff, you know. And the women came along, you know, right around the same time period, hijacked, you know, the whole civil rights movement and, and wanted extra provision protection, privileges, all kind of other stuff. Women behaved very horribly. They just... Yeah, it, it, it's if I was Malcolm X, I would feel horribly insulted. You know, I mean, if I was Martin Luther King, I'd feel betrayed by women. You know, and it, it's it's almost like a, a a serious disrespect 
a serious disservice and all that of what women have done um, to the civil rights movement and all that because Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to achieve equality for all people. I think he made that clear in his speech. And here come women saying that men were horrible bastards and just stirring up even more prejudice. Not exactly racial prejudice, but, you know, uh, sexism prejudice and just all that. And, you know, whereas the black male civil rights leaders, you know, were... were you know, they did pay a penalty. They, they were treated horribly, beat up. Uh, some of them were killed um, and all that. And, you know, they just really paid a, a horrible price. And yet women... What, what, what martyrs were there of, of the freaking, you know, feminist movement back then? And it was just stupid. I mean, if you compare... You know, uh, Martin Luther King to Valerie Solanas. I mean, Martin Luther King is just um, an amazing person, you know, especially compared to Valerie Solanas. I mean, you know, I mean, what I, I mean, honestly, I think that Martin Luther King, uh, Jr., Dr. Martin Luther King, yeah, I mean, he, he was doing something that, that, that society needed. Um, that that humanity needed to to come to grips with and all that and basically he did something necessary. Um, he made a a, a valuable mark upon society. And, and then what did Valerie Solanas and Andrea Dworkin and a bunch of these other people do? They they just spread more hate, more and more hate. I mean, oh my gosh! If I was Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. I'd be rolling in my grave, I'd be so pissed off, and all kind of other things, you know. I mean, it's just horrible what, what's been done, you know. And it's women that have put their thumb upon the men's foreheads for, for centuries, decades, millennia, you know. But, anyway, I could go on and on, on and on about female nature. Uh, and, and see, this stuff is actually human nature, but it's more manifest in the female because of her unique privilege of hypoagency afforded to her because, um, I've mentioned this, you know, uh, it's like, look at what happens in, like, in the public. Um, you know, the differential, the, dif the differential of how, uh, customers and employees are treated. You know, or, and, and you look at the customer, and it's got a resource that the, the businesses want, which is, you know, financial resource and that sort of thing. Uh, let's say this represents uh, the vagina and the golden uterus for, for reproductive perpetuation. You know, perpetual, per, it is. It represents, the common denominator in this situation is that it represents uh, perpetual existence. You know, just as uh, humans... Uh, the human species cannot exist without the womb, the uterus, the vagina, and all that. Um, you know, uh, businesses can't exist without money. So it's a, it's a common denominator resource of, 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 of perpetual existence. And then, so then, um, so then, um, and the customer in this case would represent women because they have the resource, um, uh, that would facilitate perpetual existence that the business wants. Okay. And this is so similar to how the human species is with, with, uh, with, with gender. Okay, so the customer has um, what the business needs, which is money, you know, access to perpetual existence. Okay. Now, in order to achieve that, the business has to therefore accommodate the insecurities, inadequacies, and desires of the customer. Which, for for this exercise and understanding, you have to basically put, you know, you have to understand that the customer and women, you know, females are one and the same. For this, and then the business and men are one and the same. Okay. Uh, in terms of they both represent, um, you know, uh, common denominators, uh, you know, and that's why I'm, you know, representing men and uh, men and business and you know as the same entity uh, for this 
exercise of understanding and then women and and uh, customers as you know because they they they're basically in the same roles you know uh women are in the same role as the customer uh men are in the same role as the business okay and then so then um in order to get that financial resource from the customer the business has to accommodate uh the preferences desires um you know, and all these things, the psychological and, and, and material needs and characteristics of the customer. Okay. Well, because of this, the customer learns and becomes aware that they can do anything to the business and then the business will still accommodate them because the business is naive enough to think that they, if they accommodate the customer then the customer will reward them with access to the, the resource of perpetual existence which in this case would be money so you see how that works out so the customer you know i mean you look at it fast food retail all this kind of stuff you know and um uh the the customer can just walk all over the the employees of the business and just be greedy and stingy and selfish and destructive and, and still get away with it, you know? I mean, how many, like, you know, like you see this all the time. You know, and I, I mentioned this before, you know, the amazing atheist, um, you know, he, he talks about, you know, he, he talked about one of his videos. It's the one about Big Red, you know, that, that one feminist that had the the the, uh, the fake red dyed hair, you know, the, the pinkish red color, the neon red. And the amazing atheist, you know, he mentioned that... Um, that you know those those people that go in a restaurant and order a sandwich with extra mustard on it, and then um, then when they get the sandwich, they get mad and throw the sandwich down. They say, "I said no mustard, man!" <laughs> and then they basically pretend to be a dissatisfied customer, and uh, and pretend that they've been betrayed and mistreated by the business, and then they try to basically guilt the business into accommodating the customer even further by giving them free, you know, by giving them their food for free or giving them extra food or extra coupons or whatever else to try to make the situation right, you know, try to make things, you know, try to make it all good and that sort of thing. So because of the selfishness of the customer, the business uh, achieves a financial loss. Um, and, uh, so, you know, they have to, uh, basically treat their employees worse. And, you know, and even management gets treated this way by the customers and, um, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and then, you know, management will, uh, treat the employees poorly in order to, uh, further accommodate the whims and desires of the customer. Uh, you see this a lot in the service industry, um, a lot, and um, and so you see the way that's played out in society. Well, that's how it also works between men and women. You know, in in this example I gave, the men in the business are one and the same because they are the ones who need access to uh, a, a, a um, resource of perpetual existence. And the female and the customer are one and the same because, you know, they have that resource of perpetual existence that that the business needs. And then the business provides services um, to the customer in exchange for this resource of perpetual existence. So you see the way that dynamic works out. It's the same way between both genders. And, you know, and now, like... You know, when you go out in public, you know, it's customers of both genders doing this uh, to the business. But the point is, you know, uh, so you can see it's universal human nature to be selfish like that. But when it comes to, you know, interaction between the genders, uh, the female will do it to the male. And in the event, you know, and, and it happens so often. And in the event that a male does it to a female... Oh my gosh, we get to hear about how horrible men are. And, uh, yeah. And, yeah, it's just, it, you know, and, and whenever men are slandered and defamed and all that, who speaks up for them? Yeah, people are afraid to. So, so who's really oppressed? Who's really mistreated in society? It's the men. 
Now, there are some women that are treated horribly, but then again, so many men are treated horribly, and there's such a thing as, you know, um, as paying, you know, the, the consequences for one's actions, you know? It, you know, if a, if a man, you know, cusses at a female, who's to say that she wouldn't be the type to cuss at him also, or yell, or anything like that? You know, maybe the men are starting to treat women like an equal, because after all, for a long time, men have treated each other horribly. Uh, just like management will treat, you know, employees horribly at a business in order to please, you know, the customer. Anyway, this recording is 55 minutes long, uh, approaching 56 minutes long. So that means right now it is 11.05 a.m. I gotta start, you know, doing other projects and all that before I get ready for work. Um, seems like all I do anymore is operate a pallet jack at my job. And um, anyway, uh, I am Manslave. I run the Validation Warfare YouTube channel. And this is probably going to be a video response to uh, a video put out by Dude, De uh, Dude Desi 7 which is known as Shake. Um... Um, uh, and, uh, and this is a video response to, uh, well, it can function as a response to his video titled, The Myth of the Angelic Eastern Woman.